Hi, so welcome back to our weekly long crime update. So most of the updates this week are about the Murdoch trial, but I do have a quick update on the Sarah Boone case. So on Wednesday, the court approved the defendant's motion to incur costs for a private investigator. Uh, the defense is allowed to spend up to 10000 for a new private investigator, this um, uh, entity called Lewis Iran and Associates. So as I mentioned previously, Ms. Boone's first attorney had already engaged a different per private investigator who had spent at least 125 hours on the case and was approved to spend an additional 150 hours on the case for for PI expenses in September of 2021. Now, of course, we don't know if that second 150 hours was actually used, so perhaps this latest motion that was granted um, Wednesday is to finish that work up. Hopefully that's the case. Um, as of right now, the case is still set for the final pretrial conference for March 28th, with trial to begin on April 10th. Fingers crossed. I plan on covering, um, I do plan on covering the Boone trial and parts of it will be in person, so stay tuned. Okay, so the rest of the updates this week are on the Murdoch case, and this was an exciting week for. We ended the week on Friday with the prosecution resting their case, and so here are my takeaways from this week. So we started off the week with really gruesome but important testimony from the from the medical examiner and what the medical examiner she's a professor as well and you could totally tell how how um, respectfully and thoughtfully she took this really difficult te difficult testimony and um, imparted that knowledge to the jury so I thought she was very effective um, but what we learned from her was how did the shots occur what were the body positions um, when the various shots happened? How close some of these shots were likely to have been made? And all the rest of the detail of the just horrible um, details on the, the damage that they both um, had from the shots. So um, what's interesting is we still don't have an exact time of death, um, but we do know which shots were fatal for both Paul and Maggie. Um, okay, so the second highlight of the week for me was the testimony from Maggie's sister. And I thought this testimony was so powerful. Um, I mean, at first it showed all of the support that the entire family had for Alec after the murders, but there was still something that she testified was a bit off. In particular, when she talked about Alex's comment the days after the murders that he was determined to avenge Paul's um, death and her sister thought that was just a bit odd because she would have thought that the first thing his first priority would have been finding the killers um, so I think that's going to be impactful testimony for the jury on the defense side there were some helpful um, testimony from her sister um, she talked about she testified that Maggie and Alex had a good relationship and that he really loved her. So roadside shooting and Rule 404 was a huge development that happened later in the week, and it really was a dramatic development for the prosecution. Um, so to take a step back, the prosecution had been wanting to get introduced into evidence the September 2021 roadside shooting where Alec alleged that he had been shot by someone on the side of the road, which turned out to be a whole hoax and basically an insurance fraud scheme. Um, the judge had first denied that that roadside shooting evidence to come in because he found that it was too prejudicial under Rule 403. So here's an excerpt of his ruling on that issue. Well, the financial um, evidence was allowed uh, on the issue of motive. This evidence, I find, uh, goes beyond motive or is not evidence of motive, but more toward common scheme or plan 
uh, it does not survive the logical relevancy test, uh, and it um, goes more towards showing the propensity to commit uh, violent acts, uh, which would cause it not to survive the 403 analysis. Um, I believe that to allow this evidence is a bridge too far uh, going down this um, path of allowing essentially any and all evidence in. Uh, the, you know, we have guardrails. The court is to um, place guardrails to keep things within a reasonable realm. And I believe this, as I stated, will be a bridge too far. It does not meet the logical relevancy test. Uh, I agree with the defense that it would be um, admissible, perhaps, if the trial was a trial on the financial um, theft issues, but not on the murder. So I um, grant the motion to exclude this evidence at this time. Of course, as we have seen, uh, things change. And who knows? Unfortunately, on cross-examination of, of a SLED witness, the defense opened the door by eliciting testimony regarding what the SLED officer knew about Cousin Eddie and potential drug dealers, how much Alec might have been doing drugs, the monies that he might have been using t for those drug um, transactions, alleged drug transactions. And so this is what the court found opened the door and allowed the prosecution to bring in the whole shooting. And so here's an excerpt of the court's ruling on that. Excluding the, uh, not allowing the uh, roadside shooting incident, uh, during cross-examination, I find that the defense opened a door to all of that testimony um, by questioning the witness as to um, the relationship between Mr. Murdaugh and Eddie Smith, uh, payment of money to buy drugs, indebtedness, his overall relationship, and um, in order to not mislead the jury and to under the doctrine of completeness and fairness, the court reverses its decision and will allow examination of witnesses regarding that relationship. In my opinion, this was a significant setback for the defense. Um, that said, I do believe this will be one of the main issues raised on appeal in the event that Alec Murdoch is convicted of the murders. But again, it cannot be underestimating how really damaging all of this testimony was. Um, so finally, as I mentioned, the prosecution ended its case on Friday with what we have been waiting for this entire weeks of trial, a comprehensive timeline. Wow. It's incredibly detailed, it's over 40 pages, and it includes all the information. It includes GPS data, OnStar data, cell tower data, cell phone extractions, including phone calls, text, separate Verizon records, health tracker data, you know, iPhone tracker health data with steps, the Snapchat videos and messages, all of that was detailing the movements of Alex, Maggie, and Paul on that fateful day on June 7th, 2021. And it started from the beginning, the entire day. It was fascinating. And I'm so glad the prosecution did this because I was myself trying to keep time, my own timeline, and it was so much information that I knew was like really good information. But I'm so glad that they wrapped it all up and so, you know, at the end, it's going to really come down to what the jury believes happened in those mere minutes after the time of 844 when the witness, numerous witnesses identified that, that video that Paul made of his best friend's dog and 
all the testimony of the witnesses that were so close to the family that said unequivocally the voices on that video were Alex, Maggie, and of course Paul, who was taking the video. And so from 8.44 to 9.06, that time when we know from the G- the GPS data, from the OnStar data, the car data, that that is when he left the house at 9.06. So what happened in that time frame? That is going to be critical of what the jury believes really happened. And this timeline really set the picture. It was impactful and in my opinion was some of the best testimony we've seen tying it all up together. So I'm planning on going through um, the timeline in more detail and marking in the timeline where there's inconsistencies because we know there are already inconsistencies. We know that from what Alex said in his several of his um, of his interviews with the police after the murders, we know for example, one that hit me like that was, you know, in the interviews, Alec mentioned that he had been home for a few hours and that him and Paul had been, quote, messing around for a couple of hours. Well, now we know it was like not even, a, maybe not even an hour between when the time Alec got home and Paul got home to the time when they um, then went back to the house to eat. It, it's such a tight timeline. And so anyway, I'm going to be making a video um, this week showing all of those inconsistencies because one, I think it's interesting, but I also want to use that to follow now that we're in the defense's case and see how the defense addresses those inconsistencies. So that's a, that's my video I'm planning on posting this week. Um, so, but that's it. Um, so that's a wrap for this week. Thank you again so much for joining. Um, if you enjoy this content, please consider liking and subscribing and I hope to see you back soon. Thanks. Take care.